So what about the role of hijab in the Iranian societies? Like let's say in Western countries, like myself living in Australia here, I can sometimes I can hear the uh West like Western left narrative kind of thing. Like hijab is like we can say empowering, you know, stuff like that. It's like a bit regressive. I would say for personally myself, but I mean, apparently. In our point of view, especially the ex-Muslim point of view, because we have significant knowledge on our theocracy, our Islamic studies and stuff like that. We know it is patriarchy. We know it is oppressive. But when it comes to the Western left, especially the like left, like far left organizations in the West, like some Trotsky's group and stuff like that, they say, oh, we should not do it that way, you know, like that will be racist, stuff like that. And they counter the Islamist narrative. And we can even see that kind of narrative in the mainstream left, such as like Island Omar. It's like she is the most mm -hmm. significant politician in that sense. So like, what do you think of that kind of oxymoronic politic in the yeah, West? Well, first the, of all, let me, yeah. let me be clear about this. Like, you know, when I'm and anytime like you know I criticize hijab, it doesn't mean like I don't recognize the right of the people to be Muslim or like covering their bodies or like whatever they want to. Uh, I believe in free choice, and I support it and I recognize that right. You are free to believe in what sort of nonsense as you would like to. That's I respect that and I recognize that right. But if you ask me like you know what's the role of hijab, you know when the revolution happened, uh, as I said, the Islamists were supposed to take control of the country so they were supposed to attack the other like you know movements of like a political movements and other like a political parties so oppress them so they could get the power and control the whole country the one important fact they used that was compulsory hijab so they attack women as a half of the society and send them home and then after that they oppress the whole society so if they the the sometimes like quite often say like the 1997 revolution in Iran was Islamic revolution, but you have to be careful about that point that over like, no, it took six years for the Islamists to have this compulsory hijab law in Iran. So if it was like, you know, the Islamic revolution or if like, you know, people were just like, you know, was on the street to have hijab on TV or in public, it would immediately happen after downfalling the like previous regime, but it never happened. It took six years for the government to like you know make hijab as a compulsory law. So basically, hijab in Iran and for the Islamic regime is not a free choice. It's an oppression tool. It's it's a uh, it's something that the government oppress the other people, specifically women. Um, and it's not only hijab, you know. In Iran at the moment, we talk, we can say like there's like a sexual appetite. So you as a woman, for example, cannot be the president. You cannot be a judge. You cannot divorce. You cannot have your own kid. You cannot travel outside the country without your husband's permission. You cannot have passport without your um, husband or your dad's permission. Uh, you need to have hijab in public. If you don't have hijab, you cannot go to university. You cannot work. You cannot go outside. Yeah, and the hijab that they're saying is supposed to be in the way that they want to. So it's not only like, you know, having a hair, hair scarf. You know, Masa Amini, for example, the girl who got murdered, he had, she had hijab, but the hijab she had was not good enough for the Islamists in, in Iran. So that's why they killed her, you see? So <clears throat> if you ask me, it's, it's like, you know, we have, we're talking about like, you know, sexual apartheid against women. And of course, homosexuals, LGBTQ families. So hijab in a country like Iran or like Afghanistan when Taliban is in power, 
is basically is an oppression tool. It's not about like a free choice. It's not about like, you know, you choose to be Muslim or not. It's a like, it's a symbol of Islamism. And it shows that there's Ali Khamenei as a supreme leader of the country and he controls the women's body and he controls the women's behaviors and dressing and the whole society is under oppressed of these brutal Islamists. In the West, however, where there is no like, you no. Know, compulsory law that people are supposed to be, I mean, people are free to choose what they want to wear. First of all, um, if you go deep on, um, how to say, the Islamic rituals, like, you know, I've been studying Islam. By the way, I'm coming from Mashhad, which is like, you know, second biggest city in Iran. And it's a very religious city. Like, you know, if you know about the Shia Islamists, the eighth Imam is in the same place I'm coming from. So there's like a huge mosques and there's like a, bunch of like Islamic schools so if you go to Islamic schools they have like you know so many how to say like you know features and um, like you know food and like you know, the best schools actually are Islamic schools and I was attending there like you know extra like you know, plus like a normal high school and secondary school I was at the Islamic school as well so basically if you go deep on the Islamic rituals um, hijab doesn't come by a free choice for anyone. You believe in God, you're supposed to cover your body. Uh, that's it. It's not like you choose to, like, for example, in, in Islam, you, you, you are free to choose your lunch, yeah? You are free to choose your partner. But you are not, as a woman, you are not free to choose the way that you would like to dress up. So it comes by oppression, basically, uh, according to the ideology of Islam. And in the West, most of the women are coming from like, you know, the Islamic majority countries in the West, in the Europe, Australia, North America, they are oppressed by their own families. So we have like honor killing in Sweden, for example, in Stockholm, I'm, I'm living, uh, we have this Fadima day. Fadima was the girl who got like murdered by their families because she would like to have a Swedish boyfriend. So we have still honor killing over here. So most of these girls, like a young generation of the uh, immigrants coming from Middle East or North America, they are mostly oppressed and forced by their parents to have hijab. Uh, also, there are like um, uh, these institutes, uh, imams who try to brainwash the people and convince them to have hijab. And of course, we have like, you know, Islamists who are uh, how to say the soldier of the political Islam in the West. I can mention some names. In the UK, there is like, you know, Zainab Rights. If you like, you know, just search on the Instagram, you will see her page. Or Zara Alavi, also she lives in London. And if you just check what she, the, the sort of like, you know, the products she produced on the social media, they are basically all the soldier of political Islam in the West and promote hijab. And of course there are people who freely like choose to have hijab but in most of the cases i would say like you know it's oppression against the immigrants <clears throat> and that's i mean this is more important i'm not just gonna like you know make it short but this is like in a very most important point that i think everyone should be keen about um you have to answer this question after all why there are why the like european european countries accept the like you know refugees political refugees i'm not talking about the people who come in by the work permit or like student visa. I'm talking about war refugees, Syrian, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, what these sort of countries, why they accept like refugees. The main answer is they are workers. They are mostly cheap workers. They are there to learn the language and go to work, get a job and pay the taxes. And they would, they need like, you know, according to this capitalistic rule, that's how I see it. They need to have like a different class of the people. They, ha they have like, you know, according to the, like, you know, the, this sort of like multiculturalism ideologies, they are like, you know, group of immigrants, um, different part of the city. So they never mix to each other. There's like a different class of the people. So if you belong to the, like a poor class, then it's like, you no know, much easier. You go for the cheap jobs um work more and get less salary in stockholm for example there's specific ghettos only for black people calling coming from somalia and these sort of countries there's a specific ghettos for islamic like you no know, people coming from like you no know, islamic countries iraq syria iran these sort of countries there is like a specific place for people coming from east europe 
and there is the place that Swedish people, the Swedish citizen live. So you will see that do this capitalistic uh, system we have, there's like a different class of the people. So if you belong to the like in the lowest class, it's much easier to oppress you and like go for like, you know, harder jobs, uh, work more and get less salary. And hijab is a tool to to like how to say to, to define your identification as immigrants. You're not a you're not a local. You're not equal to the Europeans, to the to the, to the citizens. You are the second citizens, basically. And hijab is that th that's how hijab works in a capitalistic world. And if you ask me why these what so called leftists supporting hijab all the time, I don't think that they re they really care about the immigrants. And humanity they would like to have this sort of like a class of people in society so basically these people would work more and get get less salary or like pay the taxes it may sound like you know conspiracy theory sort of thing but that's how i analyze it that's how i see it because like most of these leftists like in in in, in sweden for example venster party the left party the leader of the party is nushi Gosta. she's iranian she was born in Iran. So but I, I'm pretty sure he know, she knows what's happening in Iran. And I'm pretty sure she knows the role of hijab in oppressing women, but they still support it. And they still stand on the side of the Islamists. So I think you, 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 you need to, you need to like, you know, have this sort of like a Marxist sort of analyze so to, real, to realize how hijab works in the modern society and how, it helps the government to oppress uh, people, specifically immigrants. I'm done. Sorry for too much talking. <laughs> That's a really great analysis. Yeah, I think we should go to the Marxist analysis of how things works. I think this is what most of the Buzzers, the leftists miss at the first place, because like they never come from the materialist analysis. They are already thinking of in the kind of like Buzzers, the kind of like, liberalism kind of like you know, you know something really funny I mean, yeah 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 <laughs> you know because like you know we have this like ex-muslim organization in europe like in sweden for example they call me racist <laughs> <This list>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. This I think so that's funny. Common. yeah yeah i yeah. have some protests against uh mayam i saw that one and some of the left group make an article about her being islamophobia i was like what the hell? She survived <laughs> from the Islamist religion and she has every right to fear the Islam. I, she, they were like, what? I was like, go and live there. And then you talk about the Islam. And they, ne like, they never you know did what? take the challenge. Talking about like, you know, immigrants and refugees, right? No one really care about them more than me because they're my friends. They're my families. I'm one of them. I am a refugee in Sweden. Yeah. yeah. So how on earth you can call me like racist? Racist against who? Myself? My family? This is very stupid, but they still saying that. Like, I was in one of these like a meeting by the young, oh, like a left party in Sweden, and I was just criticizing Islam. And one of them said, "Like, you racist." It's like, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, man, yeah, they are guilty, and that kind of like guilty conscience that makes them regressive. That's really bad. I had to fight a lot here as well. Like, I myself is a ex Muslim. And then when I came to here, there are some groups who are willing to listen to us. Like there are some groups who are really uh, sympathetic to the Islamists. So like the love itself is not really uh, monogamy, honestly, it's not really homogeneous. So, but some of them are really like defenses of the Islamists. And in that, uh, at that time, what I do is like, okay, go and live to the Islamic country and then we can talk about it. I challenge them and they never take the challenge they cannot because like most of them are really progressive when they when it comes to their life right they don't believe yeah. in like compulsory kind of thing they don't believe in the um like patriarchal values and stuff like that but they won't survive a day if they live in the like religious fundamentalist countries so i challenge them like go and live there and then we can talk about islam and they are like and one more thing is like you need to listen to the experience of the girls coming from a country like iran or afghanistan like i i have like one one year younger sister she lived sister that she she lives in london she's my sister and anytime i talk to her she said like you know the insecure society where there is like you know many people come and touch you on a street 
and also the morale police also attack you and arrest you. And at the end of the day, you always feel that your body doesn't belong to you. You cannot control your own destiny. You cannot control your own body. You don't, you are a second citizen or like the third citizen, even less than second in that society. So you need to listen to these people and their experience. Like I, like 90%, 99%, like I don't have any specific statistics, but like, I can say like, you know, big majority of the Iranians, Iranian females, who are abroad, they don't have hijab. They remove their hijab. Like if you see an Iranian with a hijab in the West, they're most probably coming from the government because like normal citizens of Iran, they hate hijab. And how on earth you're talking about like refugees, right? And it's still promoting hijab in a society. And if you, if someone like criticizes hijab, you, as you said, labelize people by Islamophobe or like racist. This is just hypocrisy, I would say.